Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, budgeting and forecasting. This is uh, the second piece of our nonprofit financial management uh, discussions um, coming from last week where we talked about, uh, you know, financial reporting and kind of what those basic statements look like, went through some terminology. We'll review that a little bit actually in this presentation. Um, the, the bulk of what I'm going to show you here um, are some templates that we have that you can use to do budgets and cash flow work on your own. These are things that I actually use uh, in the field when I'm consulting with organizations of, of, of all kinds of sizes. So um, walking through those sort of actual ways to use this, I think is a, a good way to, to, to apply what we're talking about and, and, and you know, in a, in more hands-on than just the kind of theoretical discussion. Um, for, I think we've got some people who have been here for all three weeks that should do like a, like in a badge or something. Um, but for, for those of you uh, who are, are new, uh, my name is Hampton. I created an organization called Tiny Opera House and our mission is to uh, support small and startup nonprofits, uh, mostly focusing on helping them do the administration, all the boring business stuff that goes into running a nonprofit so that founders have more time and more energy to focus on uh, the mission and the impact work that they're doing. Uh, I've done uh, nonprofit work um, for maybe maybe 12 years um, and organizations of all sizes. Uh, I'm personally passionate about the impact that can be generated from small organizations working with specific populations that know something unique about how to, to, to deliver a mission. Um, and so that's why in my focus here is on um, is on startups and on small organizations. Um, I've got uh, a couple degrees in accounting also, so that's why the financial management piece is um, part of this. So I'll start off by addressing something, I call it the past problem. So one thing that is uh, um, limiting about financial reporting and the, the, the work that we looked at last week um, is that financial reports basically can only tell you things that have already happened. So, um, the, and then, you know, the problem with the past, of course, is that the past has already passed. But there are a couple of ways that financials can help us look into the future and give us some flexibility and some tools to actually, uh, change and, you know, change our behavior, uh, in you know in in our ability to influence how numbers are going to turn out ultimately uh, and these are of course uh, most commonly is in the budgeting process um, we're also going to look at cash flow and how those two things are different uh, cash flow is a great thing to to bring to your board meetings if, if you know if you're having those regularly that's um, you know most organizations manage based on cash uh, more than they do budgets we'll talk about both of those and then just a little bit about pro forma and ad hoc financials these are things that basically use the spirit and the ideas of projections and cash flow um, but are designed to sort of help you think through things in real time so as new scenarios come up or new new opportunities um, sort of being able to think through that not only programmatically but financially can be really helpful um, we'll do a quick review, uh, just because this is still financially based. I want to make sure that, you know, we're all on the same page. And if, and if anyone's had questions since our, um, our last meeting, um, that we can talk about those. So just some of the terminology, um, up here that we, we talked about, um, we talked a little bit about how things have different names sometimes in the nonprofit world versus the for-profit world. Uh, talked about the balance sheet. This is one of those ones that has two names um, that shows sort of a, a snapshot picture of the financial health of the organization at a period of time. Um, we've also got, of course, um, and this is this is kind of what an easy version of a balance sheet looks like. We've also, of course, got income statement. And this is also one of these ones that has two names for it. So statement of financial activities. Um, it's more of the, the snapshot or, it's, or less of a snapshot, but um, a, a picture of the activities of an organization over a period of time. So usually it's a year, sometimes it's a quarter, sometimes a month. 
Um, but it's a pretty simple one. The money that you've made less the money that you spent uh, is your change in net assets, which is the, the nonprofit term for for net income. And this is going to be our starting point when we look at uh, the at, at budgeting uh, is going to be kind of an adaptation of an income statement. Um, but instead of looking in the past, we're going to look into the future with it. Um, and here's kind of a basic summary. Again, we'll I'll send out this presentation. Um, the, there's more notes about financial reporting in the last one. Um, if anybody's missing that, I can send uh, a link to where you can download that from the website as well. Um, and then we talked about some problems and how it gets a little bit more complicated uh, in financial reporting. We talked about class financials. Uh, these are kind of the big buckets that the IRS likes us to think uh, think about our activities in. Um, and the, those are, you know, fundraising, management, and program expenses. We talked a little bit about the difference between cash and accrual accounting and how they can provide different numbers and they're basically different philosophies of, of, of how you report uh, money coming in and money going out of the organization. Uh, and then, of course, the big one for, for us in the nonprofit sector is this idea of restricted funds versus unrestricted funds, right? So this is money that comes from donors that they, you know, will qualify in some way and say you can only spend this on a certain a certain type of activity versus money that, that we raise that we can spend on anything and it's up to our discretion. Uh, most of what this creates is a, is a problem in, in managing the two different types of, of money. Uh, money that goes in the bank account tends to all look the same um, on the bank statement. So it requires a little bit of, of, of systematic understanding and, um, and the ability to, to segment these two things uh, when looking at financial reports. Does anyone have any questions about this or anything we reviewed? If you've had a week to sort of marinate on all the financial information we talked about last week. Okay, so let's start with budgeting. So budgeting is it's my favorite thing to talk about, and that's why I gave it its a whole own presentation. Um, part of this is, uh, is, is because I believe that uh, the intentionality of creating a budget does something really great for your ability to conceptualize what's going to happen in the organization. We talked the first week about strategic planning and how to set goals and the, the idea of this innovation cycle where you, you know, we're trying out a new program and then measuring to see what happens and then kind of adapting. Um, that is, you know, all great and can all exist in, in sort of narrative forms. So like I, you know, run a child welfare organization and I'm going to impact the lives of 10,000 kids and help, you know, have 16 events and all this great stuff. When you take the time to convert that into a budget, which is basically converting that into numbers, uh, I think you learn a lot about what you can accomplish, uh, you know, what's within your reach, what's sort of at the edge of your reach, um, and then it, it's easier to see how things can grow over time that way. Um, part of this is, I'm sure, based on my sort of proclivity for numbers. Um, but I do think that organizations who accomplish big things have big plans. Um, and, and that's, you know, the two sides of the same coin, plans in terms of a strategy. Um, but then what does that strategy look like uh, financially in terms of numbers? Um, and a budget is just that. A budget is basically a numbersy version of a strategic plan. So um, starting with what you want to accomplish in the organization and converting it into sort of a, 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 a basically what's an income statement, but done backwards. So, so you're looking at the same, you know, that same shape of an income statement where you've got revenues up at the top, expenses down at the bottom. Um, but instead of months in the past, you've got months, you know, months going forward. Um, oh, in, in general, the budgeting process is, is that. So taking what you're planning to do, figuring out how much it's going to cost. Um, I like to start with the expense side. There is an approach to budgeting where you, you start with the revenue. I think that's not as helpful. Um, especially for small organizations or folks who are just getting started out. Because um, this will ultimately go into uh, what we talk about next week, which is fundraising and grants, um, knowing you know how much it's going to cost to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish 
uh, from a mission standpoint, um, informs how much money you need to raise. I mean, I've, I've worked with organizations that go through this process and realize they need less money than they thought they needed. And so that, you know, how you're going to generate $10,000 versus $50,000 is, a, you know, might be a completely different approach. Um, and then that's, you know, of course, the other part of it, figuring out how much it's going to cost, um, you know, how you're going to raise the money to pay for this, um, you know, is, is basically what the buzzing process looks like. Um, I use a, a process uh, called integrated budget. And I think this, uh, I think most people might do this. I'm actually now trying to think of if, what other terms for budgeting processes are. Anyways, an integrated budget is basically you break your overall budget down into uh, a series of small pieces. So you take the same format with the you know revenue up at top, uh, expenses at the bottom, uh, but you make budgets for all the little things that constitute your overall organization. And that's because it's, it's hard to conceptualize and to think about the organization as a whole, but it's much easier to think about, okay, you know, we've got an event coming up in October. You could do a budget for that because that's a little, you know, a little finite piece of the work you're doing. If you've got a, you know, a walk-in program that, you know, is open a couple hours a day or something like that, you could do that piece because it's, it's easier to conceptualize, you know, one program at a time, one event at an event at a time. Um, so, so that's goes into our setup when we look at the budget and I'll, I'll we'll walk through the template in just a second. Um, but, you know, overall setup, taking a blank income statement, looking at future months for it, creating a different sheet for each little part of the organization. Uh, this flows through also to kind of your reporting. You know, if you, if you think of your organization as having, let's say three main programs, then those three main programs are going to be what you budget on. They're also going to be what ultimately you report financially on so that you can track, you know, the, the difference between your projections and how things worked out in the real world. Um, and how you're going to, going to continue to talk about the organization, uh, both internally with the board and then externally, um, with, with stakeholders. That's another benefit of going through sort of a formal process is it, it, it forces you to be specific and sort of iterative about um, what actually your organization does. Uh, and then you just add them all together. And that's how you can come up with a budget for the whole organization uh, by starting with budgets for the little pieces of it. Uh, so let me show you a little bit of this template and again this is this is something that that i'll send out in the email it's also available on our website we've got some instructions i've, I've probably said some of these words anyways um but this is what our if you downloaded the financial reporting template or if, if you remember when we looked at it last week uh this is sort of how it looks right you've got all your expenses up here uh, i'm sorry the revenues up here the different types of expenses um but everything's blank right now. What this sheet does is it adds together all of these different sort of smaller budget pieces. So where you would start on something like this is, you know, if if you've got four programs, I mean, I just started with four as a, as a kind of basis here, um, but, you know, making a, a individual budget for each of the programs you have. If you've got fundraising, this is again, trying to reinforce the idea of class financial reporting, uh, both because it's a best practice in nonprofits and also it's a language that you end up communicating with the IRS. Um, so we've got a budget for fundraising, management and operations, different programs. And again, they add all together. There's a couple of sort of sub, um, like, sub summary tabs, I guess, in this one, where we could have a budget that just is the programs. Uh, and then we look at it by month, we do look at it by class. Um, and then we've got a summary budget here that just, you know, it looks a little cuter. It's got a graph and stuff. Um, this is, you know, if, if you remember from, and we'll actually talk about it in this one a little bit, but but notice how few categories are here. So this is really a, a budget designed for uh, distribution to maybe the board um, where they have access to all this detail if they need it, 
but you know, in considering our audience and, and what we want them to take away from this, we've sort of summarized a lot of this so they can still see the big picture and, and, and be focused on what we want them to be focused on. So again, that's going to be available uh, for you to download and play with. Uh, and, and, and I'll to go through just some tips um, in, in this process. Now that we've talked about kind of the, the process as a whole, um, there's still a lot of blank cells in that budget, right? Even, you know, and as you split it out, it makes it easier to conceptualize, you know, what you're doing, but uh, it's, it's still, you're basically looking at a, a blank sheet of paper. So starting with what you know, uh, I imagine for any of your organizations, there's things like recurring bills, if there's rent or you've got utility bills, these are great things to, 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 to start to plug into the budget model because the more you kind of chip away at these smaller pieces, the more it's going to start to aggregate and you're going to see that you are starting to build a picture of your organization as a whole. So, so always starting with what you know, and then it'll be easier to, to, to do some sort of judgment budgeting uh, based on, uh, you know, potential programs and things like that. So always starting with what you know uh, will make it easier as you're going along. Um, if you are working with a team, I know we've got some folks who are, you know, sort of, uh, you know, having to put this all together on themselves, uh, which is fine. Uh, and it, it, if you have folks that are running certain pieces of the organization or if somebody runs a certain event, um, the people who are closest to the programs are ones who have the best information, right? So they're going to have a better sense of what to put down in terms of a budget, uh, then you may know, unless you're up close and personal with all of the things that, that are, they're happening at the organization. Um, if you have payroll, I don't know if that anyone has actually gotten into this mess yet, but if you have payroll, there's a, a best practice around separating all the payroll pieces in a budget into sort of its own section. And that's so that you can more widely share and get input and email your draft budget around um, without having to worry that you're sharing salary information. So uh, if you haven't gone down the payroll route, I, I think as much as you can put it off, <laughs> it's probably the best. It gets, Everything gets a lot more complicated when you have payroll, um, but I, I'd just like to remind folks of that. Um, it's also okay to set some stretch goals in your budget. So, you know, you may have all the things that are sort of specific to what you know, but you may hope that you can, you know, do a $20,000, you know, food drive at the end of the year or in January or November or something like that. Um, it's okay to be a little bit aspirational in your budgeting. This should line up with your aspirations in your strategic planner and your planning for the organization. Uh, it's not the end of the world if you miss your budget numbers. And, and in fact, you learn a lot about not only just how to do a budget, but also how to, to, to manage your expectations for these programs um, by uh, examining, you know, where, you know, what you thought was going to happen with the budget versus what actually happened uh, in the real world. So actual aspirational budgeting is, is okay uh, as long as you are not making everything sort of contingent on these stretch goals. So if you're planning an, an event that is going to, you know, only work if you get a strange $100,000 investor that you've never met before, uh, that's probably not a great approach, but putting some uh, some sort of stretch things to aspire to uh, is totally fine in, in budgeting, and I think is is something that should be encouraged. This one might sound um, a little like a no brainer, but uh, it's it's important in going through any of these budgeting processes too. Like I said, I like to do the expenses first because it's easier for me to figure out, you know, how much is it going to cost me to do something that I want to do 
Um, but once you have the expenses done, you take the same sort of care and I might even, oh yeah. Cause if you like, if you, if you, you know, write down everything you want to do this year, you know, save 10,000 puppies and, and you know, whatever your organization is, if you just write down a revenue number that covers that expense, that's not really going to be that helpful for you. Um, you can approach revenue budgeting the same way you approach expense budgeting. So in your capacity, you know, if it's just you or if it's you and a small team, you know, what really is feasible for you to raise uh, in terms of fundraising or events or donations or grants, um, that same level of thoughtfulness needs to be done for the revenue side, the same way you do it for the expense side. Um, you know, you may want to do $70,000 worth of programs, but in looking at your, you know, development staff of you, who's also got to do everything else, you know, realistically think you can only raise $20,000 in a year. So then those two processes are separate and then you kind of put them together at the end. So, doing the expenses here's what i want to do then looking at what's really possible in terms of your uh your own capacity for uh doing fundraising and then kind of put them together and see you know if you're close that's great uh if not then one or the other needs to be adjusted uh usually on the expense side uh it's 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 a little tricky if you uh get too aspirational in terms of your fundraising goals um but you know putting these two things together seeing where they're different and then kind of adapting uh one side or the other to make sure that they um are in line um because ultimately these these numbers should balance i mean there there are situations where you can do and present a non-balanced budget um if you're new and starting out you may want to even budget that you have extra money left over at the end of the year uh, because if it's your first year and you want to accumulate some it's savings so that you can do some more kind of you know speculative in, investments and in programs or just have a little bit more cushion so you don't have that stress of feeling like you're going to run out of money every month um, but ultimately, the, I mean, the money you bring in needs to match the money that you're going to spend um, over the course of the year, if this is a yearly budget. That's why I call it a balanced budget, right? And there's some of the same principles in terms of financial reporting apply to uh, budgets as well, because ultimately this is a financial document that gets presented and distributed to certain audiences uh, and being thoughtful of of what the point of each group is um, will kind of put you ahead of the game in this you don't want to send your budget with 15 tabs and you know 8,000 numbers um, to the board necessarily or I mean certainly to for grant reports or things like that and those are those are a couple examples that that we'll talk about here um, you know the the board needs to have access to all of the detail if they want it uh, but as a first pass for giving them a budget I would not give them more than I mean more than the detail that, that that's in that template that's just kind of you know highlights big picture uh, and then for the people who want to get more involved in, in looking at the specific budget assumptions they can do that um, Grant budgeting is, a, is another thing. When we talk about grants next week, uh, almost all of those require a budget in some form. Um, and understanding what the grant is asking for, or what the, the grant likes to fund, um, will guide you in how you present the budget. So if you're applying for a, a grant that uh, covers operating expenses, let's say, um, and there are, are some of the, those grants, then you might want to present your budget that breaks out all the detail in the operating expense category so they can see they're paying for some rent, they're paying for some, you know, consultant staff time. Uh, if it's a funding program that really just wants to, to focus on um, programs, then you would show something different and maybe just roll all the operating expenses into one line. So 
just thinking about the audience and what you want them to see, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what you want them to see and what they need to see from, from the reports, you know, will guide you in, in terms of how much information uh, you want to present to them. And at the end of the day, budgeting is a lifestyle. Uh, it's kind of like the the innovation cycle lifestyle. It actually looks a little bit similar, but setting a plan that's both narrative in terms of the goals you want to accomplish, but it's also financial in terms of a budget, executing it, measuring it, learning from where they were different, and then doing it again. So it's a cycle that... You know, the more times you do it, the better at it you'll be. Uh, and the more times you do it, the more you'll be able to to do some of these kind of on the fly reports that we'll talk about uh, towards the end. Any questions on that? I think this is the end of the budgeting section. Uh, uh, Michael's got a question. Uh, is it wise to use your budget to set fundraising goals and broadcast that vision to your board and the team? So I think that setting fundraising goals and, and sharing it with the board is a you know crucial part of it. Um, board management, and we do, I think we have a whole talk on board management, um, is a science and an art. I mean, you want the board to have the information they need to be your champions of the organization in the community. That's one of their main functions is supporting and fundraising. So for the board to see the kind of breadth of the goal of fundraising and then be able to visualize how that breaks down into small pieces to, so that they can understand their individual, you know, haul that they have to bring in or that they have to figure out how to, um, how to get from someone, um, I think is, I think is great. Um, I think if you've got folks who are on the uh, uh, that you're expecting to, to do the fundraising, whether it's the board or if you've got a consultant or a grant writer, uh, engaging them as part of the conversation and generating the budget, I think, is something you'd want to do as well so that you're not, you know, presenting a five million dollar fundraising goal to someone who's raised 50 bucks in their life. Um, and that's back to the idea of, you know, the folks who are going to be engaged in executing the budget are people that you want the opinion of as you're putting it together. Okay, anything else on, on budgets? And then we'll talk about cash flow um, in orange. I think it's orange. Yes, orange. So a cash flow projection is sort of the, the, the two main projection things we look at when when running these organizations are the budget and the other pieces, the cash flow. Cash flow is basically a budget for cash. So in uh, the in, in budgeting, uh, we're looking at basically net income is what we're looking at. Do revenues and expenses match and how do they match over time? In cash flow projection, we're looking at, uh, oh look, it's a slide that says it. instead of projecting income, it's a projection of your ending cash balance. This is so that you can take the information from your budget and adapt it a little bit so that uh, we're projecting your bank balance um, instead of income. So I like to do a really sort of simple version of this. It's, a, it's called the sources and uses method, which sounds way fancier than it is. Um, it's basically cash that comes in minus cash that goes out equals the change in your cash. Right. And then previous cash balance um, plus the change in in the balance is what is, becomes your new ending balance. So it's consolidated a, a little bit from um, from budgeting, which has a, more categories to it here. We basically got two big buckets. One is money that comes in. The other is money that goes out um, and then whatever that difference is and how that adds or reduces our cash balance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let's look at, this is another one. This template I'm excited for, for y'all to have because this is a, boards always are asking for cash flow and there's not a lot of good resources for, for, for how to put these things together. So um, there are board meetings that I go to where all I bring is, 
the cash flow. I mean, in, in terms of live management of an organization, uh, you're you're probably looking more at managing the bank balance than you are at managing the theoretical income that you're going to have in you know May of next year. Um, for almost all of our organizations, and if you're new at this, that and, and seeing that you're maybe a month away from running out of money at any given time, that's actually fairly common. And there's a a a, a a push towards nonprofits having more cash and reserves. Um, we can talk about that a little bit later. That's more of a kind of a philosophical debate. I think I have a slide at the end um, because it's always a balance. I mean, the goal of any of our organizations ultimately is to spend all of our money, right? Because people give it to us to execute the impact that they're supporting. Um, so we need to keep enough cash so that we can be managing the organization in a sustainable way, but we need to not keep so much cash that we aren't spending it on the things that are valuable to our donors and to the community that we're trying to change. Maybe it's a little bit early for the soapbox for that. But um, this this template is set up, uh, some of these are the same colors um, as the other one. Um, but you see what we're looking at is a beginning cash balance. The change in cash is a formula uh, that is you know, from down here, just the cash in, what did we get in, what went out, the change in cash. Usually when you set up these cash flows, this first number is something that you'll enter. Like if you start off with a thousand dollars, then you'll see how these formulas work where you take your beginning balance, which is a, a real number that you have to put in, adding the change, and it'll flow through for, for the rest of the time. Um, this is another one where I like to separate the details from the summary. That way, when I'm presenting to a board or, you know, if this is part of a, a packet uh, or a, any other sort of finance meeting, um, I can, you know, show the information in a way that looks kind of cute. It's not that cute. It's kind of cute. It's got that pink thing that looks kind of nice. Um, without having to, to, to share all the specific details, especially when we get into payroll, um, which, again, hopefully you're not having to deal with payroll, but, but keeping payroll out of these reports, or at least in a way that you could hide this tab or just print these tabs, um, keeps it easier to, to, to share this information with everyone. Um, so this is set up, um, you'll recognize these same categories when we talk about in just a second about kind of some tips of this. Uh, your starting point for building a cash flow model is your budget. So. The numbers that you come in from budget, let's say if we think we're going to get $1,000 a month from individuals, that's going to be the starting point that you put in uh, into the cash flow. Uh, and the, the operating, you know, the same categories that we're looking at in, in, the, in the financial reports, payroll's got the same sort of things. We even do the same, we've got some, some kind of industry standard projections about things like taxes and workers comp if, if, if that's a, applicable but um you know keeping things in the same categories means that over time we're going to have a lot of data points that we can compare to you know we compare a budget to actuals that come in from the income statement versus the budget we can compare the budget to the cash flow budget to see you know if we're uh you know, if we've got a lot of revenue planned for May, but we don't think we're going to get that money deposited in the bank account until September, those differences um, are where we really learn a lot and how we get better at at doing all this uh, forecasting stuff. So, so the setup is is fairly similar to um, to a budget. It's just that we're looking at cash balance. Uh, as our kind of ultimate goal of what we're looking at versus net income. Any questions about this template before I go back to the presentation part? Okay, so a few a few of the notes on uh, cash flow uh, projections. Um, Again, the, the starting point for this is, is going to be the numbers from your budget. Um, you then look at those numbers and then adjust for when you think that money is actually going to get deposited in your bank account. So cash flow 
we're only concerned about when things end up in the bank. Um, if you are using accrual accounting, this is where those numbers can get uh, can be different. Um, and this is, you know, back to that the wrenches we talked about last week and a little bit in the beginning of this one. Uh, if you, you know, if someone says they're going to give you ten thousand dollars, you might might record that as revenue this month, but you might not get a deposit in the bank until. November. So on the cash flow, you take that number from your budget and then you would move it over to November because that's really when the money is going to come in. So that's where we talk about this is really the cash flow is really what you're managing towards um, because it's something that is more of a living document that changes every week and you can adjust, you know, as you get more information. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, if you're doing cash basis accounting, then these numbers will be the same. Right, because cash basis accounting, which is what we do with Tiny Opera House and with our system, uh, because it's a lot easier and gives you the same level of information insight when you're working on a small scale. Uh, so if you're doing cash basis accounting, then your budget is the same as your cash flow. So that's, you know, you, you will still adjust that as you learn more information, but um, your starting point will be. Um, will just be the budget. The cash flow is something that lives as more of a ongoing management tool um, where you're always trying to tweak it so that your projections of your cash balance over the next couple of months is as correct as possible. Um, I do, you know, for board meetings, uh, I'm doing updates every, every board meeting so I can show uh, what's happening. Um, versus budgets where you generally you set a budget for the year and then you work towards that and that kind of becomes your guiding strategic document that you know offsets and, and complements your um, the strategic plan you're working off of um, but it's not something you change very often a budget once it's set should stay static usually we talk about budgets as an annual budget so you know a budget for the year once you set it you really shouldn't change unless there's something really big and unpredictable that happens. Um, that's again, because we learn the most from uh, in the budget scenario, comparing what did we think was going to happen and then what really did happen and how does that help us plan better or execute better uh, in the future? If you're changing the budget all the time, you don't learn as much because I mean, I, every one of us knows more today than they did yesterday and, and might, you know, you know, change our revenue assumptions or we got something unexpected happen. So, you know, that could change it. The, the value of a budget is really in the reflection uh, after that time period has happened. A cash flow, on the other hand, is is more of a internal management tool. So this is something that. You know, if you thought you were going to get a five thousand dollar donation this month and then the person called you and says, you know, no, I can't do it. Or actually, I'm going to give you ten thousand. That's information you would update in the cash flow, sort of in real time as you get it. Um, that's again because we're trying to manage to the ending cash balance over a few months, uh, and managing this in real time is what uh, what you can use the cash flow for. Does that make sense? Okay, I hope so. Uh, the other side of this is that uh, while we've got some aspirational budgeting room in uh, in 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 the budget, uh, that's not something we want to do in cash flow. Cash flow it's a lot worse managerially in terms of running the organization to be off in your cash forecast than than it is in missing budget. So uh, if you have let's say five thousand dollar target that you want to raise from a, a grant making organization and that's part of your aspirational you know you want to get your first uh, foundation grant this year and so you put that in there you work towards it you keep it on your budget because it helps you plan and helps you visualize what your goals are uh, things in cash flow should be 95 percent certain you know you've got to know that you're getting that money in there um, because otherwise missing things can be more problematic. That's why also in cash flow documents, they're generally the best at like a month out 
maybe three months in, in terms of the best, like, like you, you're, you're probably pretty good at projecting, you know, what is the cash balance going to be at the end of this month? And if next month you might be pretty, pretty good at it, at the end of three months, you know, maybe less good. And then the future, it's hard to really know, you know, too far out there. So cash flow is always gives you the best information right in those first couple of months. That's, that's, that are coming up. Um, but it's important to be conservative. I mean, things, things have got to be pretty, pretty certain that they're going to happen uh, to be, to be in the, the, the cash flow document. Um, it's also something nice once you, once you have done, um, done this, this work a little bit, and I'll show one more thing I forgot to talk about in the, the um, in the, document here. So the reason I have this line in here is projections is that every month, you know, I've got my cash flow projections, what I think is going to happen every month. I'll reconcile this to be what actually did happen. So I'll change these numbers. Let's say it's after January or at the end of August, you know, I'll, I'll adjust these numbers to reflect what actually happened in, in the bank account and in our sort of cash life. Um, and then I'll move this, um, Oh, maybe I'll move it. And then we'll start to call this actuals and maybe have a different color. So then the more the more time goes forward, um, you know, the actual blue bar will go forward. And, the, and this is so that you can see what is a projection and what's really happened, uh, you know, in the life of the organization. And as you're doing that, you'll start to generate some really useful metrics for you. Um, there's one that's called a monthly burn. It also sounds cool. I was going to do a whole talk just about all the ways you can sound cool talking about financials. And now actually that I heard myself say that maybe, maybe that's not possible. Maybe, maybe you don't ever sound cool talking about financials, but this is one that, that you is really helpful to know. Um, you know, what does it cost you on an average month to run the organization? Because that can sort of start to influence in your brain. Okay, every month I need to raise ten thousand dollars because it, that's my average monthly burn. You know, in my cash flow document is about ten thousand a month. So every month I need to keep. You know, that that's you know my minimum goal for the organization is that every month. Um, and all these things. You, you, anytime you know you start to to generate these numbers, you get a lot of this. Um, you know, a lot of useful information about, you know, how to manage your organization better. Um, the other thing is cash flows almost always look like this. And I, I only put almost because I, I just assume there's a situation where it doesn't look like this. But, um, you know, if we look at recurring expenses uh, of the organization, if things like rent, things like utilities, after a while, uh, our recurring expenses will exist in projections in, you know, December, you know, or, you know, February of next year. Um, those will exist beyond our list of definite cash things that we know are going to happen, right? Because that's, you know, the conservative approach to the cash flow. It's got to be something that we're 95% certain is going to happen. It's hard to be 95% certain about anything that happens in March next year. So, Anytime you look at a cash flow document, it's always going to have cash running out to zero. So it's not something you should be scared of. This is what tells you, you know, how many months do I have left? If no new money comes in or if no money that's not already specifically iterated in the cash flow, if nothing else comes in, you know, when do I run out of money? And that's always you're just trying to keep that kind of that point that it runs zero you know, as far into the future as possible. Um, again, assuming, you know, with the idea that, you know, there's no award for holding on to the most cash in this business. You know, our, our goal uh, is always to spend all of our money eventually. Um, we just, you know, need to have enough money so that we can keep raising and keep spending money and keep having the impact that we want. So, keeping this, you know, crossing point of when we run out of money far enough away that, you know, we're not panicked, but uh, close enough that we feel like we're really activating the money that we're 
being entrusted with by our donors uh, in a way that supports theirs and our goals with changing the community. That makes sense. Does that graph even make sense? I sort of did that at the last minute because I thought it was an important point to make. Budgets, you should always, you know, it's supposed to balance. You know, it, it's the money that we think is going to happen in June next year versus the expenses we think are going to happen in June um, should be roughly the same. Like that, it, it, it should should roughly balance cash flow. Odds are in 95% of organizations you look at, if you ran a cash flow, they're going to be out of money by June anyways. Everyone is almost out of money. That's, you know, if this is your first nonprofit, if this is your first business of any kind, even for-profit businesses, if you look at things that are definite, you know, definite revenues are always smaller than definite expenses because I know what my rent payment is in June but I don't necessarily know what clients are going to give me money or who's going to give donations in June. So every business for profit or nonprofit is about to run out of money kind of all the time. And you just kind of have to get used to that little tiny bit of stress. Um, and that's why the cash flow stuff is so helpful. I think because, you know, for me, if I can put it down on paper and I can see it, then I don't worry about it the same way as I do if I don't have the information. So that's why um, it's important for me in doing these to give you the templates and give you the tools um, so that you can actually do it. So we're not talking about, you know, theoretically what cash is, um, but but actually giving you some way to manage it so that, you know, again, big picture goal for all of this is less time spent worrying and thinking about the admin stuff and more time working on the mission, having the impact you want. Uh, okay, we've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to go. This is so ad hoc and, and pro formas. This is more just conceptual. Um, I think they're Latin for uh, pro forma. I think it's for forma. Um, this is another joke slide. I have a lot of joke slides. Um, these are quick projections. You know, ad hoc means you know, kind of, kind of on the fly. Uh, pro forma is a is in the form of a financial statement. Um, there are projections you can do once you get comfortable with this, you know, budgeting cycle and this idea of how you can convert a narrative or a mission goal into a numbers version of that. Um, you'll be able to, to have a better thought process around, you know, here's a new opportunity. Should I do this new program? Like we talked about in the beginning of in the, the first segment, this innovation cycle idea. You don't really know what works yet until you've done it a couple of times. And you don't even really know what the best approach is. You know, if, you, if your goal is to, to, you know, to do have cleaner beaches, you know, in, in your community, um, is the best way to execute that by organizing volunteer beach cleanups is the best way to do advocacy for bigger fines for, um, you know, for, for people who are polluting the beach. Um, so this idea that, that you can kind of do quick little projections around certain instances, I think is, is really helpful. And it gives you some more cool terms to use again, so you can sound cool um, when you're talking about financials, pro forma and ad hoc. And you can use these as plurals, even though it's not correct. Like pro formas is not actually the correct Latin. Maybe it is. I'm not. I'm not a Latin scholar. Um, but you know, just want to sort of share and and kind of uh, talk about how this budgeting thing. You know, I call it a lifestyle because it's this sort of cycle thing. But it's also a lifestyle in terms of. Um, you know, at this point, I can't think through anything that happens without at least sketching out some sort of budget. You know, oh, let's do a joint event where we, you know, have both two organizations together and we'll have an open bar and a DJ and we'll raise some money. I mean, to me, I'm instantly thinking, okay, well, how much is that going to cost me? Let me write it down in those things. How much money do I think I can make from it? And then that makes it so that I can think about, you know, the execution and you know, how this would actually work uh, in a more sophisticated way. So uh, there's more ways you can use the principles of budgeting, the principles of cash flow management uh, to affect your organization and affect 
the work that you can do and future work that you might potentially do um, than just you know the annual budget and the sort of monthly updates to cash flow. Yeah. Um, okay, so any questions about any of this? Um, a few ways that, that uh, you know, Tiny Upper House, you are, you know, again, I feel like these slides are the same every week, so maybe I'll take them off next week to make it a little different. Um, you know, the webinars I think are great. Uh, what's more important to me and, and, and specifically for the budgets and the cash flow is actually providing templates. Um, I don't know. I don't know where there's a good. I'm. A, I'm. A, I'm really excited to be sharing the cash flow template with you because I literally use that all the time. And if I do consulting work, people think I'm real smart for having it. So I'm excited for all of you to to sort of you know be able to communicate you know real sophisticatedly with that. Um, again, because you know it's important for me that that, that this is stuff that is actually helpful. Um, you know, I don't want to spend time talking theoretically because uh, we've all got so much work to do in this sort of small scale growth level that we're at. Um, the office hours, I've had I had some great conversations with folks who have, have sort of engaged through this webinar uh, uh, sign up form. Uh, I have I've done, I think, maybe six of these uh, in the past couple of weeks. And, and they're uh, it's great for me because I like doing it, um, you know, because it's something I'm passionate about. Uh, I'm hope hopefully it's great for the organizations. We talk about everything from programming to fundraising strategies to, um, you know, just things that, you know, you may have questions about. It's a little weird if you, you know, because we haven't actually met to, to like get on a Google Hangout. If that's weird, we can do a phone call. Um, some of the other things that, that I want to talk about, we talked a little bit about this idea of a, a forum, you know, where there could be questions like how do you open a bank account and, you know, how do you do you know, sales tax filing, there's things like that, that we can start to accumulate sort of a shared knowledge database. Again, because there's a ton of individuals and organizations in positions just like yours that can benefit from some of this information we're sharing. Um, another thing I thought about, and I don't know what you think about about this, I'd love some feedback. Um, there are some, some like closed Facebook groups that I've been part of, of a, a number of different things that just create a little forum for discussion where you could post, you know, does anyone have any ideas about a t-shirt printing vendor or has anyone done, you know, Google ads or found success with that so that there's, you can share information between each other and then I can bring in some moderators, you know, like myself or some lawyers or sort of program design people to kind of help, uh, you know, experts to address specific questions. I don't know if that would be helpful. I'd love your feedback on that either in this chat or through email. Um, that's of course much easier. The problem with the forum is that it takes a long time to put all those questions in. Um, you know, once it's done, it's great because in three years, someone who needs help opening a bank account, it's going to be the same information. So we accumulate over time, but it's, I think, hard to get started. So I might do, um, okay, it seems like the feedback is pretty good. So I, I'm going to go ahead and do this and invite everyone to it. And then the questions that get asked in here, I'll start to kick over to the forum. So we're kind of doing both things at the same time. Um, and again, I think the community aspect is really important. There's, you know, it, it, folks who are, you know, like you opting in to do this sort of hard work that's, uh, you know, are all doing it because you see something that's not working or you see an opportunity to do something better and you're the type of people that, you know, want to step up and, and fix it. Um, are not necessarily aware of all the other people who are also all trying to fix these little problems. And I think there's something nice about that. In San Diego, we're working on uh, doing actually an in-person meetup for all of the new organizations. Uh, in our county, we've had uh, 280 nonprofits created um, so far in 2018. Um, and I really want to see what happens if we get them all, all together and sort of introduce them also to other people in the community that are that can help um because every community has got some sort of nonprofit infrastructure whether it's a community foundation or an advocacy group or a sort of networking thing um so i'll do this this sounds like a good idea um if you haven't checked out the platform or picked a way to do the the management um 
be, that's a, a really easy way that we can help as well. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, really easy way to think through organizing your financials. And it's all set up to, to work with the templates as well so that the categories that come out of the financial reports in our system match what goes into the templates that, that we share. So, you know, we're kind of building a whole resource set for you. Um, and if anyone wants to, to do a walkthrough of that, I'm happy to do that um, as well. I think I send that link out in the emails um, or you can just use the office hour link too. Um, okay, next week we're gonna talk about, we're done talking about finances, which makes me sad a little, but um, fundraising and grants. So this is, uh, this all looks a little bit different. Um, you know, if you're new to this, either skill set wise, if you haven't done fundraising before, uh, it's also, uh, it's it looks a little bit different when you are a startup because, you know, grant, you know, grant applications and foundations usually like to see a couple years of history. Um, so we'll talk about how to game that system a little bit and back to the beginning of, uh, of not the, of the first seminar we talked about the idea of making it look like you're more of a real thing than you are and that you know, it's not meant to be insulting in any way but you know through documentation and through website planning um you know if they google you and they find all this information it looks like you've done all these programs like that those are little ways you can help with this process and then you know different strategies we talk about crowdfunding i mean that's still a pretty um you know, pretty easy one. You know, what does that look like? Um, if you've got specific questions or specific situations, ooh, you can put them in the Facebook group because I'll, I'll set that up over the weekend. Um, and then, yeah, if you've got questions about this, I know a lot of folks are excited to, to talk about the, the, the fundraising part of it. Um, so share your questions with me either through that Facebook group or through um, just email to me and I'll make sure we talk about them. Uh, are there any questions? Um, there's a question from Elizabeth about grant budgets. So I think that the budget template uh, is a great, like taking one of those tabs as your starting point for grant budget, I think is great. You know, grant budget is usually, you know, for a specific thing. So you might not have different programs within a grant application, um, but but just taking one of those tabs out that has the all the categories and all the, um, you know, the formulas that add it all up, I think is a great starting point to put all the detail in. And then I would just, you know, before presenting it to anyone, kind of smush it, um, you know, in considering what type of grant are you applying for, um, you know, adding up the categories or, or, or showing, you know, just considering, you know, who's getting that grant application in and in, in, in having that influence how you present the information to them. And that's a little bit of a, a you know, you can learn a little, you know, from what, how the application reads or what you know these organizations fund. Um, you can get some, 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 tip, some tips of, you know, how to present it in a way that, that, you know, is in line with what they're looking to fund. You know, you want to be the thing that they want to fund something and then they see your budget and it looks like you're telling the story, you know, based on what they want to hear. Any other questions about any of this or any other financial thing at all? This is going to be the last time we talk about financial stuff. Okay. Um, Thanks everyone for being here. Um, and uh, thanks for, especially for those who have come back a couple weeks in a row. I think that's great. Um, I'll probably do a survey maybe after this one, just to make sure that I'm giving you information that's helpful. And um, even this Google Hangout infrastructure, there are fancier conference call things like Zoom, but um, yeah. So I, I may send out a survey this week and would love your feedback on, on how things are going. Um, and then if you have questions, you can reach me here or uh, through any of the emails that you get from me. And um, I hope to see some of y'all next week.